Okay, so now we start with the uh, balance of God's grace and law. Now this is a basic teaching of mine that uh, we should have a balance of God's grace and law that it's God's grace that motivate us to change and it's the, um, uh, the law that tell us what to do. Now I'm sorry, I have to do one more thing. I have to copy it to another um, copy it to and to to my other website um, excuse me for a moment so I'm going to and it's the, um, uh, the law that tells us what to do now I'm sorry I have to do one more thing Okay, now I'm going to start now. I'm already now. Now, please tell me, Washington, keep telling me uh, if it's you can hear and see clearly so that I know everything is ready, everything is good. Okay, now we go to the questions so I can, I can see your message. And if anything you need to communicate with me, please use the WhatsApp. And uh, okay. Thank you. Um, so the first question is, what are the functions of God's law and God's grace? Now I hope you all remember the answer that you know uh, what is, so what are the functions of the God's law and God's grace? God's law tell us what to do. God's law is, you know, telling us how to obey God, how to love God and how to love people. That's God's law. And God's grace is because we, uh, you know, God is a God of grace and love. God is a God of blessings. He gives us all kinds of blessings. And after mankind have sinned and fall away from God, God has prepared salvation for us. And then He uh, sent us Jesus Christ to die for us. And then He sent us the Holy Spirit to move in our heart to draw us to Him. Uh, and then He works in our heart, even though when we fail Him many times, He still keep uh, blessing us, He still keep working in our life. And uh, He accepts us even when we fail, He gives us strength, He gives us spiritual gifts, He gives us every resource we have, everything we need so that our life can uh, follow God's perfect plan. So that's God's grace. So what are the functions? The functions of God's law is to tell us what to do. And the function of God's grace is to tell us what God has done for us. What God has done for us so that we can be safe and so that we can follow God, so that we have kind of strength and we can have acceptance from God. Now here I'm going to show you uh, two pictures of, of distinction of law God's law and God's grace. I hope you all remember this very well. So first, God's law tells us what to do. And then God's grace tells us what God has done to bless us. So it's very different. Law is what we do. Grace is what God has done for us. And then God's law tells us God's judgment and punishment. It tells us what to do. And if we fail, we have to face His judgment and punishment. And then God's grace tells us God's forgiveness and help to us. And number three, God's law motivates us by punishment. It tells us we have to obey this, and then if not, we have to be punished. And then God's, uh, now God's law also motivates us by reminding us, telling us what to do. But, uh, but the Motivation power should come from God's grace. So God's grace motivates us by God's grace and love. It's like in a marriage. In a marriage, it's best that the relationship is motivated by love, that a husband and wife is motivated to love each other because of the other person's love. And then number four, God's law should not be the main motivation. If that's the main motivation, people would be under pressure. 
And then God's grace should be the main motivation so that we live in grace. And I'm going to show you another um, result. If people are motivated by law, then they will be filled with guilt. But with motivated by grace, they are filled with forgiveness, that they are forgiveness of sins. And then motivated by law, people are under pressure to obey. But motivated by grace, uh, people have no pressure because God forgives them and accepts them and everything we do for God, God is very happy. And then motivated by law, uh, people can have a sense of failure because they will say, I, didn't, I haven't done so well, I'm failing, God might not be happy with me. But motivation by grace, people have a sense of accomplishment because they know that God is happy, happy with everything they've done for God. And then if we have failure, we ask God to forgive us. So when people are motivated by grace, they're not looking at the failure. They're looking at what they've done for God and God is happy. And then when people are motivated by law, then they have to say, I have done this, but he hasn't done it, or he has done it and I have not done it, so people will compare. And then motivated by grace, people would want to praise other people. And then motivated by law, people want to compete and compare. And then motivated by grace, people will want to help others so that they, uh, when we see other people do better, we are happy. And then motivated by law, people are critical of themselves and other people. They're, they're critical. And then motivated by grace, they see the goodness of themselves and other people. So we see the goodness of being motivated by grace. But when we are motivated by grace, we don't just uh, enjoy God's grace but we also follow God and obey God okay now this is the next question now why do I have these questions because even when we hear these messages it doesn't mean we can apply it even when we understand the difference between grace and the law it doesn't mean that we know how to apply in our teaching and in our daily life so it's very important today that we go through this question so that we can uh, understand how to use it. Now this passage in Matthew 9.22, it talks about a woman with the 12 years of bleeding and then she touched Jesus secretly and was healed and then when Jesus asked who touched me, she was afraid to say anything and then Jesus said, someone must have touched me because I feel power leave me. And then, and then uh, he said to the woman, Jesus said to her, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. So my question here is, what Jesus' nature do these words of Jesus reveal? So when Jesus spoke these words, so what does it reveal about his nature? And how is his love and acceptance of people? So when we look at many passages in the Bible, we want to look for God's grace, God's mercy, God's goodness, God's help so that we know that God is helping us. For instance, even for pastors, when a pastor serves in the church, and people always say, you're not doing so well, you're not preaching well, uh, you're not reaching us, then he would have pressure. But if people say to him, oh, you're doing well, you're helping us, you, you make our life go higher and higher, then he will be more motivated to serve this group of people. Now the same for us too, God continues to motivate us. So when we hear God's acceptance and His grace and His motivation, we are more motivated to obey and follow Him. And when we look at different passages, we can look for the grace of God there. We also look for the law of God, what we should do. But the grace of God there should be our motivation. Okay, now... Um, Sorry, I have to make sure that I can see myself here. Okay, I can see myself now. Okay, I just make sure that it's all clear. Okay, now, so what this, uh, these words of Jesus show his nature. When Jesus said to her, be of good cheer, daughter. That means first he accepts her as his daughter. Not as a daughter at home that uh, he will cook for her, that kind of daughter, but as a daughter that Jesus takes care of everything in our life. Now that's even better than our heavenly father. I mean, not uh, the earthly father. The earthly father can only cook and prepare for 
earthly things for the daughter, but the heavenly Father can prepare everything for us. So He is our heavenly Father. He He takes care of us. So He calls us His son and daughter. It gives us a sense of acceptance that we are accepted by Him. So this nature is that Jesus sees each one of us as His children. He is a a nature of a father, the nature of a father, a kindness of a father, acceptance of a father, the goodness of a father that he wants to give us good things. And then he said to her, be of, be of good cheer. That means cheer up, relax, don't worry. So he cares about her feeling because she, she must have fear when Jesus asked who touched me because she touched him secretly. So this woman was in fear. But Jesus told her, be of good cheer, don't worry, even though you touch me in secret, I don't mind. So Jesus cares about our feeling. This is very important. For instance, many wives told their husband, I feel pressure, I have a lot of things to do, uh, the children are not listening to me. Now, if the husband is a good husband, the husband will say, you're s I'm, I appreciate you so much, you have worked so hard, you have done so much for him. For us, I, I'm, I'm uh, very appreciative of you. But if, you know, for many husbands, they, they don't know how to do that and they don't have the motivation to do that. They will just say, I have to work outside and you keep telling me what your troubles are. You have to work out all this problem yourself. You don't tell me. So then the husband doesn't care about the feeling. Now that's what many wives told me when I did counseling. She said, talking to the husband is like talking to a wall. When you talk to a wall, there's no response. So many wives talk to the husband, there is no response. But when we talk to God, when we have problems, God will listen and respond and help us. So Jesus cares about our feelings. Very different from people. Very often people don't care about our feelings. So here we can see that He cares about our feeling. And then your faith has made you well. So it's just your faith, you don't have to uh, be perfect. You just believe that I can do it for you and then you can receive it. So here, we want to talk about any passage, we want to talk about God's grace so that people will say, God is so wonderful, God loves me so much, God cares about me, God wants to bless me, I, I can enjoy His love, I can be strengthened by Him, and everything I do, He's happy with me. Then people would have more motivation. Then people are living in grace. Okay, the third question now. Number three question, Psalm 139, 5. You have, that uh, David was talking to God. You are all around me in front of, in, and in back and you lay your hand upon me. So the question is, what is God doing when He stays around us and lay His hand upon us? Now here the verse says that God is in front of us and behind us and is laying His hand upon us. Uh, because God is a God of goodness. From the whole Bible, we see that God is a God of blessing. In Psalm 139, it talks about how God cares about us. God know, knew us before we were born. He has a plan for us in Psalm 139, verse 16. He has a plan written in His book. So all these things are good things. So when He's in front of us and behind us, he's not like a police officer. He's like a kind father, that he is taking care of us, encouraging us, and he's laying his hand upon us. In the Bible, when the disciples lay hand on people, people were uh, healed and experienced the Holy Spirit. When Jesus lay hand on people, they were healed and blessed. So when God lay his hand upon us, he's blessing us. So this is a uh, as, uh, saying that God is blessing us. He's staying with us all the time. So this verse tells us God is not far away. You don't have to say, where are you God? Where are you? We, have, we can say, God, you're right here. You're blessing me. So we can always believe that He's with us and, and He's laying His hand upon us. Okay, and then the next verse. So what I'm doing now is helping you to practice that whenever we read any Bible verse in the Bible, we will look for God's grace there and tell us what God has done. Now sometimes the grace of God is not obvious in a passage. Now we'll talk about this in a, 
uh, uh, some other days when we'll I'll talk about preaching, uh, God's nature preaching method, how to talk about His nature. Uh, but now we look at these passages that has a lot of grace. But we'll look at some passages that has a lot of law too, and I will talk about that too, those verses too. Now this verse here talks about in Isaiah 40, uh, Isaiah 49 verse 15. So can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. So a woman cannot forget her nursing child and, and she would have compassion on the son of her womb. So the question is, when God does not forget us, what is He doing? And then what does this verse show us about God's nature? So what is he doing? Is what kind of remembering is this? That Jesus, God is using the uh, the word compassion to tell us that he is having compassion on us when he thinks about us. When he thinks about us, he wants to bless us. He wants to do good things in our life. He 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 has a wonderful plan. So this is God's blessing to us. So when he thinks about us, when he forget don't forget about us, he's not. Uh, you know, just uh, remembering us and doing nothing. <clears throat> but He's blessing us. He's having compassion on us, on us. And He's planning good things for us and helping us. And then what does this verse show us about God's nature? God's nature is, He is a mind, He is, uh, I use a, a, a worldly term, He's the super, super, super computer. He can remember each person's condition. And He can see each person's condition. And he, he remembers and He cares about each person because He has compassion. He remembers each person's condition. And He has a plan to bless us and help us. When we follow Him, when we trust in Him, then we'll be blessed. But when we don't trust in Him, then His blessing cannot come to us. When we trust in Him, His blessing will come to us. So when He doesn't forget us, He's blessing us, He has a plan to bless us, and He's blessing us every moment. So when we look at all these passages, we want to think about God's uh, grace, what He's doing for us. Now, for the law too, for these two verses, what, what, what does it tell us about the law of God? Psalm 139 verse 5. The law is that, that when God is with us, then we want to have faith. Now, whatever we do is the law. Have faith in Him. Trust in Him. That's the law. So we trust in Him. We don't worry. We don't say, God is not helping me. We don't complain. But we say, God is with me all the time. And then, when God doesn't forget me, then I appreciate Him. So that's the law. I appreciate Him. He's thinking about me now. And I want to remember Him. I want to remember all the good things about God. And I want to have compassion on the people God has compassion on. God has compassion on me. And I want to have the heart of God to have compassion on people. So whatever we see God is doing to us in the Bible verse, we can do the same to obey God, to bless other people. Okay, and then uh, the third question, Zephaniah 3.17. So I, I hope that you get familiar with these Bible verses and you can use these Bible verses for teaching and you can use other Bible verses for teaching. And then for those who can write in English, you can send me messages and tell me what you have written to preach on and then I can respond to you and tell you how you are doing. Okay, now Zephaniah 3.17 he will take great in delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So this verse tells us that God has great delight in us. God is happy with us. And is happy. He has great happiness with us. And He will quiet us with His love. That His love will calm us down. Make us peaceful. And then He will rejoice over us with singing. He will be happy over us. He is uh, he will be singing over us. So what does this verse show us about God's nature? God's nature is He's a happy God. He's, now some people have an image that God is a, uh, like a judge. Now God is a judge also. 
But first of all, He's a happy God. He's a God of blessing. He's happy with everything we do for Him. When we come to Him, when we trust in Him, when we obey Him, He is happy with everything we do in His name that we do because of His love. He's very happy with us and He responds. He's responsive. When we, when we come to Him, He is responsive with joy and He's, He's a God of love. He quiet us with His love and His love has action and result. His love is effective in our life that He can quiet us down. He, had, he can calm us with His love. Okay, the next question, does God have feelings? Now this verse such, certainly tells us that He has feelings. Ma there are many more verses in the Bible that tell us that God has feeling. Here, the feeling is joy and care. He cares about us. He, his feeling is toward us. He is people-oriented. Now, we need to practice with Bible verses to find out because sometimes people can say, oh, this verse shows that God's nature is joy. But I will see more. He has the nature of care and He has uh, the nature of uh, uh, people-oriented. People are important to Him. And He has the nature of love and He is the musical nature. All musical ability comes from Him and He can sing over us. So He has musical ability and He can give us that musical ability. Okay, and then what are God's feeling toward us? His feeling toward us are His joy, His love, His care, His concern. Okay, and then the next question, Romans 8.32. He who, now these verses I chose so far, our Bible, our Bible verses that tell us about God's grace because it's very important that we are filled with God's grace and love so that when we teach we always talk about God's grace and His love and so that we ourselves can enjoy serving God we ourselves enjoy God and then we bring the people to enjoy God and like God and the Bible says if we delight in Him then He will uh, answer our prayers in our heart and He will also make us ride high on this earth that we can go higher in this world so we want to delight in God's goodness and how do we get uh, how do we delight ourselves in God's goodness when we see his goodness now I remind you that if you remember this answer of mine that you can answer this then you know I see that you are grace oriented and you can explain the Bible verses then I'll give you a certificate Romans 8.32 He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So this Bible, verses, Bible verse tell us that he did not spare his own son, he did not keep his own son, but gave him up for us all. He will also along with Jesus Christ graciously give us all things. He give us everything together with Jesus. Now the word here is all things, everything we need, and also not just what we need, but what we need to follow God's plan, what we need to make things happen in God's kingdom. For instance, now I thank God that God gave us the resource that I can do broadcast and spread the teaching to different parts of the world. I thank God for that opportunity. And this came from God's provision that God provides for us so that we can do this. We thank God for that. Okay, uh, oh, Washington, uh, I'm sorry, I remind you, please send a message to the Liberian group uh, and the other group to tell them to watch uh, Facebook right now. Okay, now the question, what God's nature does this verse show what God's nature does this verse show and what does this verse promise to us so God's nature here is that he's a generous God he's generous he gave us his son and he's willing to give his best even his son no one is willing to give his son to die for other people but God is willing to give his son to die for us to give us eternal life so that's his generous nature his love and his care for us, he he remember us. He want the best to come to us. He doesn't want us perish. So that's God's nature, and he invests in us. So together with Jesus, he give us all things. So that's another nature of God. He invests in people. He give us the best. 
So what does this verse promise us? This verse promises a lot of things. Actually, the Bible verse says all things. That means if you follow God, He will give you all things. That, that everything is available to Him. But some people say, I don't have this thing available to me now. I want to say that God wants to raise our life up first. I want to say this. After I experienced the Holy Spirit, when I first led meetings, when I experienced the Holy Spirit, already people experienced the Holy Spirit powerfully. But God did not set me free totally, to serve totally. God gave me 10 years that I would I have to quiet myself down and have a close relationship with Him and take care of my problems in my life and take care of every problem in my life and, and give us teachings from time to time. So God is doing that, building me up. Sometimes when we dedicate our life to God, God doesn't raise us up right away because we need to learn, we need to grow, we need to take care of problems. So uh, when, you, when we follow God, first when we rejoice in God and build up good relationship with people, then we start to bless the people around us. And then gradually God will use us more and more. So I hope that, that we all will uh, see God's nature and God is, God's provision for us. He, is, he has many things for us. If we obey Him and trust in Him and don't worry, all these good things will come to us step by step, not immediately. When I first experienced the Holy Spirit, I did not have so many teachings. But as time goes on, I have more and more teachings. I thank God for that. I give all glory to God. It's not my goodness. It's God's goodness. Okay, and then the seventh question. What are the differences between motivation by God's grace and God's law? The difference is that if we are motivated by God's grace, it's His love, His appreciation, His uh, reward to us, and His accompanying uh, his accompaniment with us, I mean, He accompany us and He uh, give us His presence, His joy and strength and wisdom and everything to motivate us. So that's motivation from God's grace to follow Him. And when we follow and obey Him, He'll remember and He'll bless us and he, He'll reward us. So that's motivation by God's grace. Motivation by God's law is say, I have to do this, I have to do that. And so that's instruction, have to do this, do that. And then the next step is punishment. If you don't do it, you'll, you'll be punished by God. If you don't do this, you'll be a lazy uh, and uh, wicked, la wicked and lazy servant. So that's motivation by the law. And if people serve only with motivation by the law, it's always fear and pressure. Many pastors have pressure. They, when they serve God, they're serving under pressure. But when we say, God wants to do this ministry. It's God who wants to do it. If I live in God's life and I have the joy of God, the love of God in me, and then my life will show and my ch people will have more joy and love and they will change. And God is responsible for the ministry so that I don't have to have pressure. I can live in joy and relax and, and relax in God. And yet I work hard. I work hard to, you know, to learn this teaching so that these people will see God's life in me. So that's motivation by the grace of God. Now I'm motivated by God's grace to serve God, but I'm very diligent. It doesn't mean I will lay back and relax every day. And uh, Now I relax, but I don't just stay relaxed and do nothing. I do everything God has told me to do, and I, I uh, work hard in order to be able to organize this teaching and bring it to different parts of the world. And if you have uh, pastors in other area who wants to uh, receive these teachings also tell me and then I can help them to be able to receive these messages if there is a group of pastors there who want to learn. Okay, so the difference between motivation by God's grace and law are very, very great. Okay, now what are the results if people are motivated by the law? If they're motivated by the law, then they're under pressure, they have accusation they're saying I'm not doing so well and they would uh, uh, they might want to compete they might want to compare they might criticize themselves so th there are all kinds of negative result and even if uh, the uh, you know the most positive motivation of the law is to remind even if he's just reminded to do you know 
I have to do this. I have to do this today. I have to do evangelism today. I have to do help someone today. When he have to keep reminding himself, I have to do this. I have to do that. Still, is a there is can be a heaviness on the person. But we we are motivated by God's grace. We are full full of the grace of God. We are full of love of God, and everything I do, God is happy. So I'm happy to serve God. That's very different. Many pastors, when they serve, they're serving under pressure and they give people pressure. And then people feel it's a responsibility. Only think of a responsibility when they come to church. But we, we want people to come to church with a sense of joy, happiness. I'm receiving blessings today. Okay, now, uh, can you describe God's grace to us? I, I've described it already. God's grace is... His love for us, His acceptance for us, His help for us, His forgiveness, His eternal life, His uh, spiritual gift, His presence of the Holy Spirit, His uh, wisdom to give us, His Bible to give us uh, wisdom, and His Holy Spirit to remind, remind us all the time and remember everything I do and He reward us. Is it hard to please God? Why? And my answer is, no, no, it's not hard to please God. Now, some people say it's very hard. They say it's very hard to be perfect. Yes, it's true. If you want to be perfect, it's very hard. I want to be perfect too. It's very hard. But when I tr strive to be perfect, I don't give myself pressure. And I know that every single step I do to follow God, God is very happy. God is happy not, you know, not... God doesn't have to wait until I'm perfect before He's happy. Everything I do for God, God is very happy. This is very important because Jesus said, if you give, one of, uh, give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, you by no means lose your reward. So Jesus said here, even when we do a little thing like a giving a cup of cold water, we'll by no means lose the reward. So even giving a cup of cold water will please God. And when one sinner repents, the whole heaven rejoices. So the whole heaven will rejoice when one person repents now if God is happy with repentance God is more happy when we love him he said that he'll give us you know things that we uh, cannot imagine that uh, its eyes have not seen ears have not heard and the human mind has not thought of so when we love him he'll give us all things so it's not hard to please God it's hard to be perfect but we're striving to be more perfect but when we're not perfect, we ask God to forgive us. And then we say, thank God I'm doing this. I'm improving today. And then we can appreciate ourselves. Thank God you're helping me. First, we appreciate God you're helping me. And thank God I'm responding to God. And I'm responding to love God more and obey Him more. And God is happy with that. This way, we have more motivation. And we know that God is happy with us. Even when we s greet someone with uh, friendliness, with love, with care, God is happy with us. Any little thing we do for God, God is very happy. So uh, uh, this is different for many people. Many people, they, you know, I, I have to say this, I hope you don't mind. Some preachers will preach like this. You didn't do well enough. You didn't bring anyone to Jesus. You didn't do this and you didn't do that. And it's always saying, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Or a husband said to a wife, or a wife says to a husband, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. It's always saying you didn't do it. But we should say, you have done this. It's wonderful, you have done this. It's wonderful. So we should learn to appreciate people for what they have done and not to criticize. We want to, uh, when people uh, follow, they are sinning without awareness of sin, we'll guide them. We talk about God's love and we guide them to repent and come to God. Okay, and then question 11, what happens when we seek God's kingdom and love Him? So the Bible says that when we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, all these things will be given to us. Now what does seek God's kingdom mean? Seek His kingdom means first we want more people to enter the kingdom of grace. One more, we want more people to be saved and have eternal life. So that's seeking God's kingdom. The second meaning of God's kingdom is that where God is the king, there is His kingdom. So we let God rule our life, there our heart becomes His kingdom. We let God rule our family, then our family becomes His kingdom. So we seek God's rulership in every place we go to. We got, seek God to be guiding us and ruling over our life. And then all these things will be given to us. Okay, number 12 question. 
When ministers are motivated by the law, how would the law affect his ministry? What are the characteristics of the people under his ministry? Now, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I have to say this, that there are a number of pastors who serve under the law. And, uh, and the Bible actually teaches to, to be motivated by His love. Now, the Bible does have the law to warn us, but that's not the main thing. The, law, the Bible has a lot of grace of God to motivate us. When we come to look at the motivation, we find that mainly is from the grace of God. So when pastors minister always with the law, what happens is then he will be under the law himself. He will be under pressure. I have to work hard. I have to help this church to grow. They think of themselves helping the church to grow. I have to obey. I have to do this well. I, uh, uh, I'm not preaching well enough. I have to preach with power so that people will change. You know, it's, it's all the responsibility on himself. And when he preaches like that, those people would catch his, uh, his, uh, his feeling under the law also. The people would feel, oh, you have to do this, we have to do that, so they're under pressure. So the characteristic of the people under this ministry would be they are under pressure, they are they, they have a lot of guilt, they have a lot of comparison, they'll say I'm better than he or he's better than I and they say I'm not good enough, they're critical of themselves, so these are not good results. But when people have joy and strength and be motivated to love God and love people, people will see this kind of joyful Christians, they're more motivated to follow God. So if a church is full of people who are joyful, who love God, you know, people like to come to the church and stay in the church. Now, I, I use this illustration. If a pastor say to his members, uh, you're not joyful, you're not, people don't stay in this church. You don't care about people, people don't stay in this church. He's just using the law. But he can tell people, um, you know, we are loved by God. Everyone here is loved by God and God wants to bless us. And today we have a newcomer here today and we want to let him know that God loves him and we all love him too. Now this way I'm motivating with the grace of God and when we care about him, God is happy with us and God will bless us all and God wants to bless this newcomer so we can rejoice in the Lord and we can rejoice when we serve and bless other people. So this is motivation by the grace of God. Okay, and the next question, when people are motivated by God's grace, does it mean that they are lazy and sin easily? My answer is no. If they totally understand God's grace. Now, I'm saying we need God's grace and the law together. We have the grace of God to motivate us and we have the law to obey. We have the grace of God. It doesn't mean we don't obey. We obey everything the Bible teaches us to obey. We obey this and, uh, and we know that when we obey this, God is very happy with us. So when we are motivated by God's grace, we say, uh, first God accepts me and then cares about me and give me eternal life and there's so many people out in the world they need Jesus and when I have these good blessings I want to bring these blessings to God so this person will be motivated if he understands God's grace if he feels God's grace I'm so loved by God so many people don't have your love I'm so blessed to, can, that I can experience your joy and your love I want other people to experience that too. So when people are full of the grace of God, they want to serve God more. Now at the same time, we need the law of God to remind us what to do and to warn us too if people are lazy. So we need both. But for a motivated Christian, he doesn't need the law to motivate, to, to warn him. Like for me, for myself, I will not say, if I don't do the teaching, God will punish me. I don't tell myself that. I, I would tell myself, I'm very happy to bless people and God is very happy with me. I don't have to say, oh, God will punish me if I don't do it. So I, I'm motivated by the grace of God and I'm fully motivated. Okay, next question. When people are motivated by God's law, does it mean that they will serve diligently and joyfully? Now we notice that when people are motivated by God's law, always saying, I have to, do the, I have to preach the gospel, I have to tell people about Jesus. Now that's true. But when they don't have the love of God, then it's just, they have to, they have to. But when they have the love of God, then they will say, I'm, I do it willingly. I'm happy to do it. So uh, when people just have the law and don't have grace, they will, 
they will say, I'm not doing well enough and I don't know if God is happy with me. So I hope that we all uh, are filled with the grace of God and then motivated to obey God. Now this section, because it's the most important section, so I have many questions here. I have more questions than in the other section here. Okay, now the next question, Romans 8.15, that says that, uh, that tell us to receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So what are the differences between the spirit of adoption and the spirit of bondage? The spirit of adoption to be sons means that we are adopted by God to be children, His, his sons and daughters. We, have, uh, you know, we come to God like a child uh, to His Father, that we come to Him with, with confidence. We know that God knows our needs. Now many people in trouble, they'll say, God, please help me, I'm in trouble. But when we have the, the spirit of sonship, we'll say, God knows my need. You know, I always tell myself, God knows my need. God knows uh, what I need and God has a plan. So I don't have to worry about uh, provision or what to do. He will provide for me and He'll open the way for me. So I have the spirit of a son, not a slave. That some people serve like a slave. I have to do this, I have to do that. I didn't preach enough. These people don't believe and don't obey uh, well enough. I have to preach more and to push them harder. Now that is the spirit of slavery. Uh, some people serve with the spirit of slavery. So this is very important. So I hope that when you write mess messages for me to look at, make sure that it's message full of grace to motivate people to follow God and obey God. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says the love of Christ compels us, motivates us. What does that mean? That means we are motivated by God's love because He loves us so much. We love what Jesus loves. I love the people that Jesus loves. I love to do the things that God is happy with. So I'm motivated by God's love, not motivated by the law, motivated by God's love to obey His law. Okay, number 17. Please describe what prayer of grace. Okay, there's off here. Prayer of grace, prayer of worship, and interactive prayer. How can these kinds of prayer help us? Now the prayer of grace is declaring God's grace toward us, from God to us. God is loving me, God is helping me, God is blessing me, God is happy with me. So every day when we wake up we can say, the Lord is happy with me, God is blessing me today, God has a wonderful plan for me today. So we can start with saying all the good things of God. So that is, uh, that way we feel happy about ourselves. And then uh, prayer worship is from us to God. I worship you, I love you, I adore you, I need you, I hold on to you, I'm happy with you. I put in these elements there. That's delight in God and depending on God. Lord, I need you, I depend on you. And then interactive prayer is whenever we pray, I know that God is happy with me. Whenever I pray to God, God is happy with me. God is happy to bless me. God is happy to give me good things. Hallelujah. Okay, number 18. What are some words of grace, words of encouragement and blessing that we can say to people? Now, in this session, I have talked about also words of grace to people. Words of grace are something like this. Oh, you're doing well. I'm happy with what you do. You, uh, you're a diligent person. You love Jesus. You have a great future. And God is going to bless your whole life. And So these are words of grace to appreciate people. Not just giving pressure to people. The words of the law, we can say in a gentle way. For instance, we can say, we can uh, say to people, um, how can we uh, improve our relationship? Do you think our relationship can improve? Uh, do you think we can communicate more? Do you think we can care for each other more? What can I do to bless you more? What can I do? to build up a better relationship with you. So these are words of the law, how to obey, how to uh, bless each other, help each other, how to communicate better. And then we use questions to guide the other person. So gentle ways of using the law. When we preach to people too, we can say, God is blessing you. Do you want Him to bless you? Then we can come to God when we pray to God. 
God is very happy. So this is using questions to guide them. Do you believe that God blesses those who come to Him? Do you believe that God wants to bless us? Do you believe that when you follow Him, He is very happy with you? So these are using questions to guide people to think about God's grace and think about how to obey God. Okay, and what are some ways we can guide and encourage people to change with God's grace? Uh, so that's something I just said. So if we want people to read the Bible, we can tell them the Bible is full of the promises of God, it's full of wonderful th things of God, and when you read the Bible, you understand His grace and His wisdom, and you will grow him, in Him more. You have confidence in God, you know what God has promised, so you have confidence. And when we want to motivate people to serve God, we say, whatever you do for Him, even a cup of cold water, He'll be very happy and bless you. So do you want to be able to bless people? These people can enter the kingdom of God and be blessed by God all the, his lifetime. Do you want to be able to bless people? And when you do it, God is very happy with you. So this way I'm motivating people to obey God with, with uh, guidance, questions of guidance. Okay, now the next part now is motivate people to change with God's grace. How can we motivate people to change. The first change is motivate people to love God. How can we motivate people to love God? Uh, with these Bible verses, how can we motivate people to love God? With these by, uh, questions. Now I've sent these questions to Washington. Whoever wants it, you have an email or WhatsApp, I can send it to you also. So this verse says that in John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. So how can we motivate people to love God with this Bible verse? This Bible verse tells us that He first loved us. And God's love exceeds the love of anyone on earth. Can your parents follow you everywhere you go? Can your parents help you with everything? Can your parents give you wisdom? Can your parents give you eternal life? Your parents can help you in many ways, but they cannot give you eternal life. They cannot help you everywhere. They cannot follow you every day. But God first loves us. He follows us every day. He prepares salvation for us. He blesses us in every way. He sent His Holy Spirit to move in our heart. He works in our life all the time. So He first loves us. So are we willing to respond? Now on earth here, if someone loves you, if your spouse loves you very much, you want to respond and say, I thank you so much for doing this. When your child comes to you and show love to you, say, Child, you're so wonderful, you, you love me, I'm very happy with you, then we'll respond. If we don't respond to the child, the child is not happy. Now, with God, when He has loved us so much, we want to respond to His love. Then there is a, a, a bond of love that holds us together. So we want to respond to God's love because He first loved us and His love is so great. So we first motivate people with God's love. To motivate people to love God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So God has prepared many, many good things for those who love him, and things we never imagine. So this is the wonderful thing about God. God knows that we love him, he remembers how we love him. He will reward us and He will reward us here on earth first. He will prepare for us things we never imagined. So that's how wonderful God is. So are you willing to love Him so that we will enter God's plan? When we enter God's plan, His blessings will come to you all day long. All the things you never imagined will come to you and you're full of blessings and, and uh, everything you need, you'll have it. And it will be beyond your imagination. So every day there will be new surprises, new wonderful surprises. Okay, and then the next one. Uh, John twenty one fifteen. So when they had eaten breakfast, that's when Jesus appeared to the disciples uh, at the Sea of Tiberias, that Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. Here we see that um, Jesus, He loves us first. And He won His kingdom of God, a kingdom of love. His kingdom is a kingdom of love. Everyone in this kingdom of love experience love from God. 
and experience love from each other. So God first poured His love upon us and we can all build this kingdom together by bringing more people in the kingdom of God and by loving them. So when Jesus sent Peter to take care of his sheep, his sheep, Jesus first asked him, do you love me more than this? Because only when we love him more than this, then we can have a close relationship with God and then we can be changed by God and then we have the motivation to love God and love people and we are full of love. So Jesus wants us to be full of love before we love people. So do you want to be used by God? When you're used by God, God is very happy. God will honor you and God will bless you because you love Him and serve Him. So if you love Him and serve Him, it's the greatest privilege for us that we are the servant of the Most High God. And what we do is pleasing to God and God is very happy to us. So do you want to be part of that army to bless the people, an army of love? Okay, and then now number four is warning. Now we, we, we can have warning too because the Bible does have warning. But the proportion is that we should have more grace and instruction. But warning should be less. For instance, I said, I did, I did not warn myself. If I don't teach these people, I don't help these people, then I'll be punished by God. I don't tell myself that. I, I'm motivated by the grace of God. That's sufficient for me. But some people, they're lazy. They need to be reminded and they need to be warned. But we don't want to, every time we see them, we warn them. But the Bible does have warning. So how can we warn people who don't love God with this verse? 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Oh Lord, come here. It's in uh, Aramaic. It's uh, Maranatha. You might have heard that word, Maranatha. It's the Lord, O oh Lord, come. Okay, so if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be a curse. So if someone doesn't love God, he's cursed. So this is warning. When we believe in Jesus, uh, many people believe in Jesus, but they just want blessings from him. But they don't want to respond to Jesus' love. They don't want to love God and don't want to love people. And they don't want to say, God, you're so wonderful. I appreciate you. I thank you. Every real Christian would have thankfulness for God to show that he's a real Christian. Because a real Christian will have the heart of God, uh, that they have the life of God. And then they want to thank God. And then he, they want to love God. If they don't love God at all, that means there is something wrong with the spiritual life. And this person can lose salvation and they can be cursed by God. So we want to, when we come to Jesus, we don't just think of Jesus heal me, Jesus give me money. But we say, thank you Jesus, give me eternal life and I want to respond to you, I want to love you, you're so wonderful, everything you've done for me is so wonderful. You know, we can count all the blessings of God in our daily life, the food He has provided for us, uh, He has given me the Holy Spirit, He has given us the Word of God, He has given us the pastor to help us he has given us everything so i want to thank god I, and thank god even though we fail him many times he still come to bless us then that way we will say god is so wonderful and i want to love god but when people don't respond to god's love they can fall away from god's grace and they can lose salvation now you notice even when i use these bible words i first talk about a lot of grace a lot of grace when we Love Him, He will respond to us. Even though it's not found in this verse, but it's found in the whole Bible about God's grace to those who love Him. So we can put that together. We can, you know, uh, when we apply God's grace, it's not just from the Bible verse. We can apply from the whole, pas uh, whole passage. Okay, and then... Next is motivate people to pray. How do we motivate people to pray with these Bible verses? Matthew 6, 8 Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So here this Bible verse says that God already knows our needs before we pray. So God cares about us so much that He pays attention to each person. He knows what we need. When he knows, he'll prepare. 
And then when we trust in Him, when we have close relationship with Him, then the blessings will be able, able to come to us. Then our heart is open. But if people's heart, their hearts are closed, then God's blessing cannot come to them. When our hearts are open, God already knows our need. When we trust in Him and we call on Him, we pray to Him, we thank Him. Sometimes God gives us blessings when we thank Him, even before we ask. Because it's the re relationship. When we have the relationship with God, God will bless us. So when we open our heart to God, and God will give us blessings. So this verse tells us that He knows our need. So the more you pray, the more you'll be aligned with God, and God can give you all the blessings. So, as Zephaniah 3.17, He will take great delight, great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So this verse tells us that God is very happy with us. He's rejoicing over us. He's uh, uh, quieting us with His love. So this, He is a joyful God and He's a God of relationship. So when we come to Him, He's very happy to come to us and bless us. So when we come to Him, He'll be happier and He'll rejoice more and He'll bless us more. So are you motivated to love Him more? Okay, and then... John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So if we live in God and then His words stay in us, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. So this promise that if we have a good, good relationship with God, that we always stay in God and His words stay in us, that we obey His word, then whatever we ask, that He will answer us. So when we obey God, God will give us everything. Now many people say, I have, uh, I have a lot of trouble. I have a lot of shortage of things. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough this and that. So they just look at what they need. But if we have a close relationship with God, God will open the way for us that He can really provide for us and He'll bless us. So we want to say, you know, the more you live in Him, the more you receive from Him. The more you pray to Him, the more you receive from Him. Okay, and then uh, Isaiah 58, 14. Then you shall delight yourself on the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the earth. So this Bible verse says that when we delight in the Lord, uh, delight ourselves in the Lord, that we're so happy with God, when we're happy, then we will praise God, we thank God, we're happy with Him all the time. Then He will cause us to ride on the heights of the earth. He will cause us to go higher and higher. So that's wonderful when we delight in Him. And in the prayer, we can rejoice in Him more, we thank God more. Oh, you're so wonderful, hallelujah, I delight in you. And then God will cause us to ride higher and higher. Okay, now the, this last point is the warning. How can you warn people who don't pray with this verse? James 4.2 You lust and do, not, and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. So he, here is a Bible verse of warning. But before I go to the warning, I will first go to the grace of God first. You know, when we love God, when we love people, when we have a good relationship with God, God is happy to give us everything. And uh, so if we love God, we don't have to worry about things. But there are people who just look at the things in the world. The more they look at the things in the world, the more trouble they have. Here it talks about people that they lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You try all this way to get it, but you don't get it because you don't ask. First, you don't pray. And then you pray and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. Some people just pray, I want to have a most beautiful wife, I have the uh, best house, I want a, the best paying job. They just want things for themselves. Then they just look at the things of the world. Jesus wants us everyone to follow him to take up the cross and follow him take up the cross and follow him and then he'll give us everything we need and so we want to come to god and say lord i know that you're god of provision i trust in you i have a good relationship with you and then you'll bless me in every way i can relax in you and trust in you 
Hallelujah. And I, I know that you are God of provision. I don't have to worry about anything. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So here I've shown you how to use uh, uh, the grace to motivate people to, uh, to love God and to pray. And then uh, the, uh, we'll have a short break and then we'll continue with motivate people to read the Bible. Now all these are questions. All these are questions. And then, so people who get, want to get a certificate, you should try to answer these questions. And also, even for everyone, we should learn these questions. Okay, God bless us and have the motivation to live in the love of God all the time and enjoy God. Hallelujah. We'll have a short prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, because you're a God of grace. You're a God of blessings. You're full of grace and mercy. You're full of love. You want to love us and you want us to love other people. We want to obey you and love other people. Lord, help us to care about the people around us. Help us, bless us uh, in our life. Raise us up to a high level. We want to follow you totally. And then our whole life will be blessed by you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now before I stop, I want to say this. Please remember to keep a distance from people during this time of the coronavirus that uh, even in Hong Kong now, we have more people pick up the, uh, the virus, but it's not as bad in some other countries. Uh, in some other countries, it's really terrible. P please keep a distance and just say hi to people and wear masks. I'm at home now, so I don't have to wear a mask. Wear a mask and keep a distance and just say hi to people and bless them. That way uh, we keep ourselves healthy.